Would you stand with me all over the building and let's, let's go to the Lord in praise and worship today. How many knows that there's victory in Jesus tonight? Sing it with me. Aren't you thankful tonight for victory in Jesus? Praise God. God is good to us. He has blessed us beyond measure. What a great day we had this past Sunday. The Lord was in this place, wasn't he? Sunday morning and Sunday night. Thank God for his blessings and all that he is doing in the midst of all the storm and trial and chaos that's going on in the world. God is still God. He's still in control. We can cast our cares on him. We can depend upon him. Things are happening at a rapid pace. It lets us know we're nearing the end. I'm praying even so come Lord Jesus. Praise God. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. Remember those tonight that are in need of God's healing touch. Continue to pray for Brian. I talked with him yesterday and he is in good spirits and doing well. Uh, he's expected to remain at Wake Forest for about three weeks to make sure everything is working good and getting him, getting his strength that he needs, but he asks us to continue to pray for him. Pray for my wife's two sisters, Alice and Sylvia, both need a touch from God tonight. Continue to pray for my mom. She uh, continues to get weaker each day. Pray God will be with her. 
Do you have any unspoken requests but lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these tonight. Pray God's anointing upon his word and upon this service. Our Father, we're so thankful tonight that we can come together to worship you. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for prayers that's been answered. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and are doing and will do. We know, God, that you're the great healer, the great physician. You know every need before we ask. But you said, ask and we shall receive. We ask you, Lord, to touch those tonight that are grieving and brokenhearted, that you'd give them the comfort that they so need. We pray, Lord, above all, for those that are lost tonight to be saved. Let there be revival in the land, a turning to you, Lord, a turning away from sin, a turning away from the world and the devil. Help us, Lord, to call upon your name, for there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. Thank you for the privileges you've given to us. We give you glory and honor for all this. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Would you take a moment? Welcome one another tonight to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us. tonight that there's something about the name of Jesus. It's a powerful name. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Sickness is healed at the name of Jesus. What a powerful name and wonderful name Jesus is. Let's sing this tonight. There's something about his name.
never fails. Let's sing that again. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You will not prevail because Jesus never fails. Let's sing that one more time. He never fails. Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails, you might as well get thee behind me, Satan, you will not prevail, because Jesus never fails. Amen. We thank you that you never tithes and offering. Lord, we just thank you for this church we have, Father Jesus, for this facility that you've given us, Father Jesus, and it's all because of our people that give for the tithes and offerings, Father Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. We give you praise for that. We've always had, we've had the call, we've always answered, Father Jesus. We thank you for it, Jesus. We give you praise and glory. I touch these tithes and offerings tonight, Lord Jesus, for the glory be with us and guide us, Father Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Lonely days and lonely nights filled with despair cause me to long Beverly, I, I enjoy that. I love those old songs. Over the past few weeks, as you all know, we've been examining passages of scripture that have been called difficult. About a month ago, I taught on difficult scriptures from the Old Testament, and guess what? 
Tonight, we're going to examine some difficult scriptures from the New Testament. And we talked about some of the reasons why scriptures are difficult for us. We talked about the language difference. We talked about culture. It was very different back then. But I think you would agree with me that the Bible is full of what humans would call contradictions. Would you agree with me on that? How can poor people actually be rich? How can a servant be greater than a king? How can we at our very weakest be our strongest? And theologians, as you know, have tried to explain these mysteries since the Bible was written. And I might add, quite poorly. And Matthew, I want you to read, if you would, the reason why. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Okay. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, we serve a mighty God an awesome, mighty God, and we do not realize just how awesome and mighty he really is. There is no way as human beings we can understand the greatness of his mind. But we need to try, don't we? And as we ask God for guidance and as we study, he will open up to us with the help of the Holy Spirit, precious treasure in these mysteries. And the first one we're going to start with is found in Romans 9, verses 9 through 18. And the question is, and I want us as we read and talk about this, to have this in our mind. The question with this difficult passage is, does God select some people for salvation and not others? So Matthew, would you read that scripture, please? For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Okay. I want you to think with me just a moment. Think about this. Think about some key things. When we read this, it would appear that before Jacob and Esau were born, while they were in their mother's womb, before they did anything good or bad, God chose to love Jacob and hate Esau. Does it appear that way as we read this? What do you think? It appears that way, doesn't it? Does it appear that God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart so he would not let the children of Israel go? Does it appear that way? It does, doesn't it? Now, I remember being a little girl and and reading this and thinking, this just doesn't seem right. It does seem like God has favorites. But the reason that we, I think, as humans, misinterpret the scripture is because we take scriptures, we pick them and pick them and pick them out by themselves. We can't do that. And as we go forward, we're going to talk about that a little bit. 
has anyone been, I, I think you probably have grown up in a church other than a Pentecostal church. Anyone? Okay. These verses have been misinterpreted and have become the foundation for what we know as Calvinism, which is also called predestination. Has anyone heard of this before? Yeah. Thank the Lord the Church of God does not accept that. Thank the Lord the Scripture does not teach this. Basically, it says that God, before the world began, chose certain people to love, to be merciful to. Those people are elected or chosen for heaven. No matter what they do, they cannot leave God and backslide. The unlucky people who were not chosen are doomed to hell. That's basically what they believe. You know, as we look at scriptures, it's critically important that we look at the whole counsel of the Bible. It's critically important to remember that, and, and you know, I, I looked at a lot of commentaries on this, and I didn't agree with most of them. I'll be honest with you. The Bible is the best commentary for the Bible. We got to look around in it, and we'll find the answers that we need. And I would also like to say this. Those of us who have served God for, for several years, we know him, don't we? We know him. And the longer we serve him, the more we know him. And I want to ask you tonight, as we've read the scripture, I want you to think about this. Does the God that you know, does the God that has done so many things for you, think about what he's done for you. Does that God seem like the kind of God who would choose certain people for salvation and reject other people? Does he? What do you think? I don't know about you, but the God I serve is not that kind of the God. Not at all. What kind of God is he? He's good, and he's fair, and he's just, and he gives chance after chance after chance. So, no way. But let's look further in the scriptures and disprove that. Matthew, would you read what we all know as the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This tells me that God chose everyone. Does it tell you that? Everyone was elected to be saved. Everyone was chosen to be saved. Would you agree with me? Jesus died for Adolf Hitler, the worst sinner, the same that he died for Paul or Peter or us. There was no difference. He came for all men, all men. And if that was true, Calvinism, would it not have said God loved only certain people and he sent his son to die for those people? Would he not have said that? Because, you know, the Lord is a straight shooter. He really is. What he says here is pretty straight, isn't it? There's another problem with God just selecting people to be saved. And that is the, the problem of choice. If God just selected people... Would we have any responsibility of our own salvation? Would we? No, we would not. Would it mean anything to you if you held a gun to someone's head and you said, you tell me you love me? Hmm? No. We forget the kind of God that we serve once again. He wants our love. He wants our devotion. He wants us to choose him. That's what he wants. And once again, let's read Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, 
whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise the Lord. This tells us we have a choice to make, doesn't it? Everyone has a choice to make. Let's go ahead and look at 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Matthew. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter's talking to the saints. And you know what we need to look at? There's a key word in this, and it's foreknowledge. Meaning before. Meaning before we were born, before Jacob and Esau and Pharaoh were born, God knew who would choose to serve him, who would choose to love him. And that is why we can say God is fair and just. And when he was referring to hating Esau and loving Jacob, he was simply saying, you know, I love Jacob because he loves me, because he serves me. Esau, I hate what he's done. And we know the experiences that Jacob had, the latter. You know, Jacob didn't start out too great, did he? He was a deceiver, hated because of what he had done. But when he met God, when the ladder came down from heaven, he chose God that day. He chose to serve God that day. We know a lot about Jacob. We don't know a lot about Esau. But I believe with all my heart that Esau had opportunities as well. He had parents, the same parents, the same heritage, did he not? But he chose rebellion and to turn away from God. And it's a serious thing. It really is. So let's move on to our second passage. And I appreciate y'all being with me. I know some of this is kind of it's, as the title said, it's difficult, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's a blessing when we read God's word. Our second passage is going to be coming from 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10. And the question with this is, when the restrainer is mentioned in this verse, who or what is that restrainer? And Matthew, would you go ahead and read verses 1 through 4? Now, brethren. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. As this chapter opens, Paul is addressing some concerns that this church has about the coming of the Lord. Someone had come in among them and told them that the Lord had already come. Now, what, how would you feel? We look for the Lord. It's our hope. How would you feel if someone came into this church and preached or pastor? Let's say, I know we wouldn't do that, but let's say, how would you feel if somebody said, hey, you're looking forward to it, but it's already happened? How would you feel? You'd feel pretty bad, pretty hopeless, wouldn't you? These saints were hopeless. They were worried. Paul is trying to assure them the Lord's not come yet because two things have to happen before he's come and we're not seeing these two things yet. 
The first event that Paul talks about is a great falling away from the faith. And I think we are witnessing that today. You know, I grew up in the church of God. And I remember times where, you know, people came to every service because they wanted, because they were coming expecting God to do something. When revivals were held, we were there every night. We were excited because the Lord was going to bless. People would come and get saved. Their countenance would change. Their life would change. They would be back that night on a Sunday morning. They'd be back. People didn't have a problem giving up anything that they felt was displeasing to God. Anything. Today, it seems as if people want to hold on to whatever they can of the world. It's almost like the gospel has become fire insurance. I just want just enough of God to stay out of hell because I certainly don't want to go there. Are you seeing these things? We're seeing the great falling away. People are led away by their own lust. Have you ever seen such filth in your life? I don't feel like I'm that old, but I have seen such changes in my life. And let's be honest, some of it is in the church. I think if we really knew what happens in people's lives in the church, we would be shocked and appalled. Things that are hidden. But he knows, doesn't he? He knows. Apathy is what we're seeing. So we're seeing the falling away. The second thing that Paul says must happen is the man of law lawlessness is going to be revealed. And this man is doomed to destruction. And this man is the Antichrist. This man will become a great leader. He will come in peace. He will be, I believe, handsome, very charismatic. Many Jews will accept him as the Messiah. He will be able to solve seemingly unsolvable problems. But as time passes, he will oppose those who worship God to the point of death. And he will proclaim that he is God and sit himself up in God's temple and be worshipped there. So these two things have to happen before the second coming. Now, the second coming is not the rapture of the church. The rapture is just on that timeline. We're seeing the falling away. The next thing we're going to see is the rapture. Then the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. Later, after the tribulation, Jesus will come back the second time. So let's read on verses 5 through 7. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining him, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So in verses 6 and 7, Paul informs us once again that the mystery of lawlessness is at work. I remember Pastor preaching a great sermon about this. Would you not agree with me that we have lawlessness in this world and a spirit of deception like I can hardly believe, really, where God's people are accepting things that are not that are clearly wrong. We feel kind of bad because these people are nice. They're nice people. You know, hey, they're nice, and um, maybe it's not so bad after all. You know, this is dangerous thinking, this kind of stuff. 
And that's exactly what he's talking about here. When good is called evil and evil is called good, the spirit of lawlessness is here, isn't it? But something is holding that lawlessness back. Something is holding this man, this antichrist, back. And commentaries disagree with this as well, even the commentary, our commentary. But I think the scripture is pretty plain, and I know I've heard Pastor preach about this, and I agree with what he has said. We have some clues. Notice that the restrainer is called he, not it, but he. Also notice that this restrainer has power over the enemy. I believe this restrainer is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that abides with us and in us. And I believe that this restrainer will stay as long as the church is here. And many disagree and say, well, the Holy Spirit has always been here. There's no way he can be taken out of the world. And while in the Old Testament, he moved upon God's people. We know he did. He moved on David. He moved on Elijah. He moved on so many. But he moved on them. He never dwelt in them. And I think Pentecost was a pretty big major deal, wasn't it? His coming to earth was a distinct thing. He was there when the church was born. He's with us every day. He gives us strength. He gives us guidance. He gives us encouragement. He convicts us of our sins. But when his job with us and in us is over as the church, when we go up, I believe he's going with us. He's going with us. That's not to say that he might have specific works here on earth that the Lord would have him to do. But I just believe he's going with us. I believe he's restraining, he's protecting his people while we're here, while he's still working here from this evil. And I don't know about you, but that blesses me to think about it. I think we give the enemy too much credit. We give him too, way too much credit. Let's look at our third difficult passage. And the question for this is, can backsliders come back to God? Matthew, would you read uh, verses 1 through 3? Therefore, From let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. And be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. And this comes from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And in these verses, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians. And I think this is also important, the context in which it's written and who the letter is written to. And he's writing it to the Hebrews, and he's saying, you know what? It's time you moved up. It's time you leave the rituals of Judaism behind, the, the feasts, the sacrifices. Move through it. Move past it. Mature in the Lord. And as we've heard it so many times, move past the milk and into the meat. What was happening here is some of these Jewish Christians were leaving the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were turning away and they were going back to Judaism. Think about that for a moment. Think about leaving the grace of God the freedom of Jesus Christ and going back to rituals that could not save. And think about it. You know, he was talking to these folks, these Jews. Do we see today people leave the freedom and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ for meaningless things? 
that cannot save. Do we see that? We do. And while this does apply to the Jews, you know what? It applies to us too. Matthew, would you read uh, verses uh, 4 through 8 there, please? It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessings of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So let's look at the very first verse there. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. There's a big shift in the language and the mood of this, isn't there? The writer is first saying, you know, you need to mature, you need to, you know, you need to move closer to God, leave this stuff away, and God permitting, you're going to do it. And then all of a sudden he says, it's impossible for those who have known God, who have known the Spirit, to be brought back to repentance. Would that not lead us to believe backsliders can't come back after they've left God? When you just read this on its own, would you not think that? Once again, we've got to take the whole counsel of the Bible. We've got to ask for guidance from the Spirit. And we have got to think about the kind of God we serve. Before we go any further, does the kind of God you serve, is he a God who you get one chance, you blow it, it's it, you're, you're done. Is he that kind of a God? How many of you with me are a Christian of second and tenth and hundredth and millionth chances? Hmm? I know I am. God's done an awful lot for me. When I was unfaithful to him, he was always faithful to me. I don't believe that's what it's saying here, do you? Let's look and find out what it means. I think the, the critical thing to look at is there's two types of people. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call one the backslider, and I'm going to call the second an apostate. And I want to talk about the term apostate first. An apostate is a person who fully knows the truth, who has experienced God's power, his goodness, his mercy, and they willingly turn their back and reject Jesus Christ. They're not misguided. They've not been tricked. They've not been led astray. They've made a conscious choice to turn their back on the truth. You know, when you cross a bridge and you burn that bridge behind you, you cannot go back. When you constantly reject the truth, God will turn you over to a reprobate mind, meaning you can't come back to him, just like the bridge. When it's gone, it's done. These people don't want to come back to God. They reject him completely. And I think one of the best examples in the scripture is King Saul. We know King Saul is the first king chosen by God to lead Israel. We know he was anointed because he prophesied. We know he saw great mighty wonders that God performed. But Saul became proud. He became rebellious. He knew full well what he had done. He knew he was doing wrong. 
but he didn't care. He didn't care. God warned him over and over, and he refused to repent. When Samuel, the prophet who loved him, prayed for him, God said, you know what? I don't want to hear it. I do not want to hear it. Saul has rejected me. Therefore, you know what? I've rejected him. That's a pretty scary place to be. And you know what? When the scripture said you're, you're crucifying Jesus all over again, you know what that means? When you reject him, when you reject the love and the goodness and that sacrifice that he made, when you reject him hanging on the cross, when you reject him being beaten and abused and you say no, no, you're putting him to public shame again and you're mocking what he did. And those are the people that God is talking about here. Let's look at the backslider. They're different. I think the best example, one of the best, is of King David. David got his eyes off God. He was easily led astray into lust to do terrible things. He had Bathsheba's husband murdered. He was tricked. He walked away. But never in the time that he was away from God did he ever really reject that God was God and he was sovereign and he was merciful and kind. And when the prophet of God confronted him with his sin, he did not do like Saul and make excuses and stiffen his neck. He was truly sorry and asked God to forgive him and changed. That is what a backslider is. We must never, ever, ever give up on those who have walked away from God. You know, we, we have the attitude sometimes about these people. Well, I wouldn't have done that if I were them. I wouldn't have done, you know, that's terrible. What he did is horrible. While we puff ourselves up and feel self-righteous, do we not do that? We need to pray for people. I need prayer. You need prayer. We're all on the same road. We're going to heaven. And none of us are perfect. Every person in this building tonight can be led astray. When we get our eyes off God, we can be led astray. We can. And that's what happened here. But the God that I serve, when we are led astray, he's the kind of God that runs. He is the kind of God that will leave the 99. And he came out after me. And he looked for me. And he called to me. And he came and he picked me up. And he called me his own. And he took me home. And I praise him for that. Matthew, would you read Hosea 14, 4? If, let's ask the people who say there's no hope for backsliders. Let's, let's ask them to read this verse. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. Praise the Lord. And I would say to you tonight, I, I think we're all Christians here, but I would say, because we're all the same, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in places that we're not as close to God as we once were. And sometimes we feel discouraged because, Lord, I've done it again. I promised you I wouldn't do that, and I've done it again. You ever been there? You ever felt like, Lord, why? You know, 
I can't get this right. I can't do it. I've tried a million times and I've failed a million times. Look at these people. They get it right. I never get it right. Have you ever felt that way? I have. But we serve God who will help us, who is merciful and kind. Never too late until you reject him completely. Never too late. Never. And I want to close with the story of my grandfather who proves that there's hope for the backslider. My grandfather, Velmer Slusher, he grew up in rural, country, poor area of southwestern Virginia in the mountains. Married my grandmother. She was a, a godly, righteous woman. He got saved. They had eight children, one of which was my father. They took their children to the Church of God there in Christiansburg, Virginia. And over time, my grandfather walked away from God. He began to drink heavily. He began to abuse his family in unspeakable ways, beating his wife, his children, telling them they were worthless, they were nothing. The stories my father told me as a, as a little girl made me cry, and I, won't even, I can't even repeat them here tonight. My grandmother died when she was 46 years old of a heart attack, I think because her heart was broken. But she always prayed for her children. She always taught them what was right, and that teaching went with them their whole life after she died. My grandfather left my dad in charge as a, as a child of his seven brothers and sisters. They had no food. This was depression time. They had nothing, no help. Meanwhile, he was running with women, doing all kinds of awful things. Those children were divided up. My father was thrown out. They all backslid. They were all away from God. But my grandmother, her prayers continued. You know, even after you're gone, your prayers are still working. And over time, my father, at the urging of my mother, they decided to go to church, to the Church of God in Christiansburg, Virginia. God saved them, both of them. It wasn't too many years that my grandfather, who stayed drunk all the time, just I can't even talk about how horrible it was, but God began to deal with him again. He began to deal with this awful, horrible man. And do you know that he came back to God? And do you know that this man, who I knew was a wonderful grandfather, became a deacon and an elder? in the church. You know what? God can do miraculous things. There is always hope for the backslider. Don't ever give up on them. Don't ever give up on the children, the grandchildren, the husband, the wife. Don't give up on them. God honors those prayers. He honors them. There's hope tonight. There's hope, blessed, blessed hope. We serve a good, good God. And I praise him for what he has done in my life. Pass the, thank you. Praise the Lord. I want our musicians and singers to be able to come. Some very difficult passages of scripture and, uh, Sister Bishop did a great job tonight explaining those and helping us tonight with them. Never hurts to study the word of God. The scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Praise God.
Thank God for his word tonight. Would you stand? I want us tonight to come and spend some time in prayer. Prayer goes hand in hand with Bible study. And uh, one person we failed to mention earlier when we mentioned a prayer request was Jeff Bremer. He had outpatient surgery today. Pray God would touch him and bring healing to his body. So many others are in need of prayer, especially the lost, that God would deal with their hearts. Would you let us come and pray?